Welcome to Holes. We'll be reading chapters four and five together. Chapter four. Stanley felt somewhat dazed as the guard unlocked his handcuffs and led him off the bus. He'd been on the bus for over eight hours. Be careful, the bus driver said as Stanley walked down the steps. Stanley wasn't sure if the bus driver meant for him to be careful going down the steps or if he was telling him to be careful at Camp Green Lake. Thanks for the ride, he said. His mouth was dry and his throat hurt. He stepped onto the hard, dry dirt. There was a band of sweat around his wrist where the handcuff had been. The land was barren and desolate. He could see a few rundown buildings and some tents. Farther away, there was a cabin beneath two tall trees. Those two trees were the only plant life he could see. There weren't even weeds. The guard led Stanley to a small building. A sign on front said, you're entering Camp Green Lake Juvenile Correctional Facility. Next to it was another sign which declared that it was a violation of the Texas Penal Code to bring guns, explosives, weapons, drugs, or alcohol onto the premises. As Stanley read the sign, he couldn't help but think, well, duh. The guard led Stanley into the building where he felt the welcome relief of air conditioning. A man was sitting with his feet up on a desk. He turned his head when Stanley and the guard entered, but otherwise didn't move. Even though he was inside, he wore sunglasses and a cowboy hat. He also had a held a can of soda, and the sight of it made Stanley even more aware of his own thirst. He waited while the bus guard gave the man some papers to sign. That's a lot of sunflower seeds, the bus guard said. Stanley noticed a burlap sack filled with sunflower seeds on the floor next to the desk. I quit smoking last month, said the man in the cowboy hat. He had a tattoo of a rattlesnake on his arm, and as he signed his name, the, rattles, the snake's rattle seemed to wiggle. I used to smoke a pack a day, now I eat a sack of these every week. The guard laughed. There must have been a small refrigerator behind his desk because the man in the cowboy hat produced two more cans of soda. For a second, Stanley hoped that one might be for him, but the man gave one to the guard and said the other was for the driver. Nine hours here and nine hours back, the guard grumbled. What a day. Stanley thought about the long, miserable bus ride and felt a little sorry for the guard and bus driver. The man in the cowboy hat spit sunflower seed shells into a waste paper basket, a trash can. Then he walked around the desk to Stanley. My name is Mr. Sir, he said. Whenever you speak to me, you must call me by my name. Is that clear? Stanley hesitated. Uh, yes, Mr. Sir, he said, though he couldn't imagine that really was the man's name. You're not in the Girl Scouts anymore, Mr. Sir said. He's going to always say that. Stanley had to remove his clothes in front of Mr. Sir, who made sure he wasn't hiding anything. He was then given two sets of clothes and a towel. Each set consisted of a long sleeve jumpsuit, an orange t-shirt, and yellow socks. Stanley wasn't sure if the socks had been yellow originally. He was also given white sneakers, an orange cap, and a canteen made of heavy plastic, which unfortunately was empty. The cap had a piece of cloth sewn on the back of it for neck protection. Stanley got dressed. The clothes smelled like soap. Mr. Sir told him he should wear one set to work in and one set for relaxation. Laundry was done every three days. On that day, his work clothes would be washed. Then the other set would become his work clothes and he would get clean clothes to wear while resting. You are to dig one hole each day, including Saturdays and Sundays. Each hole must be five feet deep and five feet across in every direction. Your shovel is your measuring stick. Breakfast is served at 4.30. So think about that. Five feet deep, that's like a little, that's my height. I'm a little over five feet. So that's like five feet deep and then five feet across in all directions. That's really, really big hole. And five days a, or six, seven days a week, he's not getting Saturday or Sunday off. Think about if you're at the beach and you had to dig a five feet deep hole, where would you choose to dig your hole? You choose by the water because the sand's really soft. It's easy to get into the you know depth, not up by the parking lot where it's hard, right? And that's sand. So you think about like hard packed dirt where there's been no water. The lake dried up a hundred years ago. Think about how challenging that would be to dig five feet down and then five feet in every direction. And he's getting up at 4.30 in the morning, no days off. Stanley must have looked surprised because Mr. Sir went on to explain that they started early to avoid the hottest part of the day. No one is going to babysit you, he added. The longer it takes you to dig, the longer you will be out in the sun. If you dig up anything interesting, you are to report it to me or any other counselor. When you finish, the rest of the day is yours. Stanley nodded to show he understood. This isn't a Girl Scout camp, said Mr. Sir. He checked Stanley's backpack and allowed him to keep it. Then he led Stanley outside into the blazing heat. Take a good look around you, Mr. Sir said. What do you see? Stanley looked out across the waste, vast wasteland. 
The air seemed thick with heat and dirt. Not much, he said. Then I hastily added, Mr. Sir. Mr. Sir laughed. You see any guard towers? No. How about electric fence? No, Mr. Sir. There's no fence at all, is there? No, Mr. Sir. You want to run away? Mr. Sir asked him. Stanley looked back at him, unsure what he meant. If you want to run away, go ahead. Start running. I'm not going to stop you. Stanley didn't know what kind of game Mr. Sir was playing. I see you're looking at my gun. Don't worry, I'm not going to shoot you. He tapped his holster. This is for yellow spotted lizards. I wouldn't waste a bullet on you. I'm not going to run away, Stanley said. Good thinking, said Mr. Sir. Nobody runs away from here. We don't need a fence. Know why? Because we've got the only water for a hundred miles. You want to run away? You'll be buzzard food in three days. Stanley could see some kids dressed in orange and carrying shovels dragging themselves toward the tent. You thirsty? asked Mr. Sir. Yes, Mr. Sir, Stanley said gratefully. Well, you better get used to it. You're going to be thirsty for the next 18 months. Chapter 5 There were six large gray tents, and each one had a black letter on it, A, B, C, D, or E. The first five tents were for the campers. The counselor slept in F. Stanley was assigned to D tent. Mr. Bonansky was his counselor. My name is easy to remember, said Mr. Pendansky as he shook hands with Stanley just outside the tent. Three easy words, pen, dance, key. Mr. Sir returned to the office. Mr. Bonansky was younger than Mr. Sir and not nearly as scary looking. The top of his head was shaved so close it was almost bald, but his face was covered in a thick curly black beard. His nose was badly sunburned. Mr. Sir isn't really so bad, Mr. Bonansky said. He's just been in a bad mood ever since he quit smoking. The person you've got to worry about is the warden. There's really only one rule at Camp Green Lake. Don't upset the warden. Stanley nodded as if he understood. I want you to know, Stanley, that I respect you, Mr. Bonansky said. I understand you've made some bad mistakes in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. But everyone makes mistakes. You may have done some bad things, but that doesn't mean you're a bad kid. Stanley nodded. It seemed pointless to try and tell his counselor that he was innocent. He figured that everyone probably said that, and he didn't want Mr. Pendansky to think he had a bad attitude. I'm going to help you turn your life around, said the counselor. But you're going to have to help too. Can I count on your help? Yes, sir, Stanley said. Mr. Pendansky said good and patted Stanley on the back. Two boys, each carrying a shovel, were coming across the compound. Mr. Pendansky called to them. Rex, Alan, I want you to come say hello to Stanley. Here's the newest member of our team. The boys glanced warily at Stanley. They were dripping with sweat and their faces were so dirty that it, it took Stanley a moment to notice that one kid was white and the other black. What happened to Barf Bag? asked the black kid. Lewis is still in the hospital, said Mr. Pendansky. He won't be returning. Barf Bag, what a name. He told the boys to come shake Stanley's hand and introduce themselves, like gentlemen. Hi, the white kid grunted. That's Alan, said Mr. Pendansky. My name's not Alan, the boy said. It's Squid, and that's X-Ray. Hey, said X-Ray. He smiled and shook Stanley's hand. He wore glasses, but they were so dirty that Stanley wondered how he could see out of them. Mr. Bonansky told Alan to go to the rec hall and bring the other boys to meet Stanley. Then he led them inside the tent. There were seven cots. A cot is just like something you kind of lay on. Each one less than two feet from the ne one next to it. Which was Lewis's cot? Mr. Bonansky asked. Barf bag slept over here, said X-Ray, kicking at one of the beds. All right, Stanley, that'll be yours, said Mr. Pinansky. Would you want the cot that Barf Bag slept in? Stanley looked at the cot and nodded. He wasn't particularly thrilled about sleeping in the same cot that had been used by somebody named Barf Bag. Seven crates were stacked in two piles at one side of the tent. The open end of the crates faced outward. Stanley put his backpack, change of clothes, and towel in what used to be Barf Bag's crate. It was at the bottom of the stack that had three in it. Squid returned with four other boys. The first three were introduced by Mr. Pendansky as Jose, Theodore, and Ricky. They called themselves Magnet, Armpit, and Zigzag. They all have nicknames, explained Mr. Pendansky. However, I prefer to use the names their parents gave them, the names that society will recognize them, recognize them by when they return to become useful and hardworking members of society. It ain't just a nickname, X-Ray told Mr. Pendansky. He tapped the rim of his glasses. I can see inside you, Mom. You've got a big fat heart. The last boy either didn't have a real name or else he didn't have a nickname. Both Mr. Pendansky and X-Ray called him Zero. You know why his name's Zero? Asked Mr. Pendansky. Because there's nothing inside his head. That's not very nice. He smiled and playfully shook Zero's shoulder. Zero said nothing. And that's Mom, a boy said. 
Mr. Penansky smiled at him. If it makes you feel better to call me mom, Theodore, go ahead and call me mom. He turned to Stanley. If you have questions, Theodore will help you. You got that, Theodore? I'm depending on you. Theodore spit a thin line of saliva between his teeth, causing some of the other boys to complain about the need to keep their home sanitary. You were all new here once, Mr. Medansky said, and you all know how, what it feels like. I'm counting on every one of you to help Stanley. Stanley looked at the ground. Mr. Medansky left the tent, and soon the other boys began to file out as well, taking their towels and change of clothes with them. Stanley was relieved to be left alone, but he was so thirsty he felt as if he would die if he didn't get something to drink soon. Hey, uh, Theodore, he said, going after him, do you know where I can fill my canteen? Theodore whirled and grabbed Stanley by his collar. So he'll be up here. My name's not Theodore, he said. It's Armpit. He threw Stanley to the ground. Stanley stared up at him, terrified. There's a water spigot on the wall of the shower stall. Thanks, Armpit, said Stanley. As he watched the boy turn and walk away, he couldn't for the life of him figure out why anyone would want to be called Armpit. In a way, it made him feel a little better about having to sleep in a cot that had been used by someone named Barfbag. Maybe it was a term of respect. Until we meet again, thanks for joining.